Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our EP and EP series season four. Uh, my name is Dr. Choi. I'll be the moderator for this session. And it brings me great pleasure to bring you Dr. Ma, who is actually a very renowned cardiologist and electrophysiologist. Everybody knows him in this room, I'm very sure. And today, Dr. Ma will teach us to decipher stress tests. As you know, stress tests can be very mysterious. And I'm pretty sure Dr. Ma will be able to highlight and enlighten us on how to read stress tests. Uh, to you, Dr. Ma. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chai. It's indeed a pleasure to have uh, all of you all. Um, let me see whether I can make this forward. Like this one first. You know, guys, uh, we are we are we are changing platform as you can see all the time. So I still need some time to get familiar with the platform. So uh do I advance the slide? Uh, hang on. The attendees right. can uh, look at the title now, yeah. squeaky lines and bumpy lines. Yes. Welcome everyone. Today we are going to talk about squeaky lines and bumpy lines. What not to miss in an ECG stress test. Now, I need to say again and again that EP in everyday practice, we will be talking about concepts which, which are already you guys will be familiar with. We are just reminding you all that knowledge you already have so that you can apply in everyday practice. Nothing disclosed. Now the preamble is like this. Um, I've been approached by a lot of my colleagues asking me, hey, why don't you talk about something simple and common like exercise stress test? Because it is the one of the most widely prescribed cardiac tests in the whole world. But being the most common also being one of the most challenging tests in terms of interpretation. As, as the name implies, you have the word exercise here. Believe it or not, we pay more attention on getting the findings during exercise, especially at the peak exercise, correct or not? ST segment TV changes are the things that we are looking for. And also secondarily, hemodynamics like blood pressure and heart rate response, and also symptoms of the patient. We pay much attention to the findings during exercise. What about after exercise? Now, we shall talk about this in this webinar. First case is a 45-year-old lady. She's um, uh, uh, okay, came in because uh, she just won an annual health screening. When you ask her, she said that, yeah, sometimes I have some palpitations, but that is not frequent. And of course, uh, as part of the health uh, screening package, uh, a stress test was ordered for her. Baseline ECG, I won't show you, it's normal. This is her stress test stage one at two minutes. She reported no chest pain. The blood pressure was 140 over 90. Now, I want you all to look at this stress test. I won't pull you all at stage one. I'm sure you all agree with me that no one would want to stop the stress test at this stage, right? It's too early. You need to stress the patient enough for us to get the findings that we're looking for. So let's agree on the same page that no one will want to stop this stress test. Let's carry on. Now, at stage two, at five minutes, something happened. She complained of palpitation. Now, this is something that a lot of our colleagues will say that, of course, you are running, right? Of course, you get palpitations. You are in sinus tachycardia. She has no chest pain at the time. Blood pressure is 150 over 90. Now, what would you do when you see this? Patient has a symptom, palpitation. Now, let's go back to the slide and look at it. And spend about 5 to 10 seconds. I want you all to poll on what would you do next for this patient. No known medical illness, came in just for annual health screening, had a stress test done. This is stage two at five minutes. Paul, please.
We have fourteen percent voted so far. Let's make it one hundred percent. Yep. Simple. Three options only. You stop this sort of stress test immediately based on one symptoms of palpitation. You want to continue, or you want to press the button. Got a close call here between two answers. 56% voted. In this, I wouldn't be able to go off screen and look at the polls. How's the poll result? Okay, so far we have about 42% to stop the stress test immediately. Another 42% mm -hmm. in fact to continue the stress test until higher stages and see. So we have a tie. Oh, press the button only about 20%, I guess. About 15%. 15%, okay. Now, in the interest of time, let's move on. What happened to this patient? I'm intrigued. <laughs> okay. We chose to press the button because we think that by pressing that button, which I'm going to tell you what button is that, what button was that, uh, can reveal more findings to us. So we press this button and we saw this. This rhythm came up. Now I'm going to come back and talk about this. Before I talk about that ugly rhythm, let's go back to the polling question. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we do stress tests, we need to be cognizant, understanding that there are two sets of data here. Set one is on the blue panel, which often is our focus here. It's called the synthesized data, the filtered data, heavily filtered one, whereby they are designed to provide you clean tracing in order for us to discern the ST segment. Makes sense, right? Because when we do stress tests, we really want to concentrate on the ST segment. Now, the second set of data is called the raw data. Beneath this uh, red panel here, red, red bar here, the raw data is minimally filtered. You can call it unfiltered, but actually it's filtered, but minimally filtered. A lot of noise, usually due to movement artifacts because the patient is exercising. This is a very important concept for us to grasp because two different sets of data carry two different connotations. Now, what you can appreciate in the lower panel here, the raw data panel here is, the QRS complex, albeit is being littered with artifacts, you can see QRS complex actually marching through the sharp ones. I have marked it up for you with the red arrows here. You can clearly see that the QRS complexes are irregular. But lo and behold, even though the raw data is the QRS complexes are irregular, the same lead here lead to at the synthesized data set, they are regular. What's going on here? Why is that so? And by pressing a button called the rhythm diagnosis button on your stresses machine, which is available across different brands, in GE is called the rhythm button, GE machine is called the rhythm button we are able to have a grasp of the rhythm, the underlying rhythm of the, what this patient is having. Now, clearly, by looking at lead to the raw data, we're having only one camera. So it's less of an advantage point here. So we need to press a button, the rhythm button, to see more cameras. More cameras means more clarity here. Now, I want you, you all to look at this tracing. Uh, before that, I think I have, need to show you this. Yeah, this is the GE machine rhythm button. Means that you don't want the synthesized data set, you want raw data set, which is essential, essential for rhythm diagnosis. Now, coming back to this tracing, raw data being shown here. This is the arrhythmia that patient's having. She's complaining of escalating palpitations, BP 150 over 90 still no chest pain. My question for my audience is, again, you know, your nurse or your MA, which usually they are the one who do success for you, right? They're looking at you. Boss, what to do? 
What's your diagnosis and any further instruction? You have uh, four options here. Number one, you think it's a polymorphic BT. You need to shock the patient. You think it's VM to shock the patient. You think it's pre-excited atrial fibrillation. You need to cardiovert the patient as soon as possible, or you choose to press another button. Please pull. Okay, please pull. It's getting more interesting now, Ma. It's like a glove share market right now. After you <laughs> mentioned something, people tend to yeah. do particular thing. So we are about 74% all voting for press another button. Whoa, good. Wow. Interesting. 21% says it's a pre excited AF. So we got a cardio body as soon as possible. Yeah, I'm very happy to hear, to hear that there's no one uh, in my audience say that this is polymorphic BT or BF. This is very good. 4%. 4% says it's a polymorphic BT. You've got to shock the patient. And one says it's BF, shock the patient as well. Sure. All right. In the interest of time, let's move on. Now, we press another button. You say, right, this button is called the stop button. <laughs> we stop the exercise. Why is that so? Because we want to get more clarity. The rhythm uh, button that you press, been having a raw data set, when the patient is moving, you will have a lot of movement artifacts. You need to press the stop button for clarity, for you to diagnose the rhythm. As you can see clearly from the previous slide, the QRS complexes are already irregular. You need to establish the diagnosis here. Now, I want you all to answer this. Now, this is the rhythm strip being obtained at recovery at one minute or two minutes, you know, very early in recovery. She's still in this arrhythmia. She's still complaining of palpitation. What is this? Sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or atrial tachycardia? Please go. Wow. Looks like... Uh... Atrial tachycardia is going very strong at about 65%. Wow. Yeah. No, no one got atrial fibrillation? What? No. Oh, yeah. yeah. 20% got atrial fibrillation. Because, uh, you know what? Throughout the conferences uh, nationally uh, and also internationally, I used to say that if you see a rhythm which is irregularly irregular, 99.9% .9 is atrial fibrillation. Remember what I said, huh? it's still true. We need to be in a tandem, huh? <laughs> 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 Okay, 72% AT and uh, AF 18%. The rest will be flutter and sinus tachycardia. Great. All right, let's move on. Very good. Now, I want you all to appreciate the P waves here. All be in the conferences, I say that. Irregularly irregular R interval means AF until proven otherwise. This is rule number one. But rule number two trumps, trumps, as in Donald Trump trumps. Trumps rule number one. If you can see a P wave, it cannot, cannot be atrial fibrillation. Because in atrial fibrillation, there is no atrial contraction, hence no P waves. Now, if you can see across the board here, the blue arrows. Is, is pointing towards the P wave, P wave, P wave, P, P, non conducted and another P. Now I've drawn this purple color P for you to appreciate that. Be aware that, be aware that the P wave can be very cheeky, it's hiding inside the ST segment, causing this so called ST depression here. And also the P wave can also hide the T wave, causing this tall tended T here. So if we can see a P wave marching across with uh, leading the QRS complex, this is atrial tachycardia. Now the final analysis uh, was atrial tachycardia. Patient was finally re uh, finally received. Sorry, very uh, mistake here. Finally received EP study of radiotherapy therapy in May 2016. 61 my old case here. She was last seen officially in 2017. Since then, he has been asymptomatic after the patient, but she came back and saw me in 2019. Recurrence? No, not recurrence. She's so happy that she brought me a Chinese New Year hamper. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, knowing when to press which button is very important. 
Because think of a sequence of event here. If we press the wrong button at any time interval here, we would have missed the dialysis all along. Number one, if we stop the stress test too early due to artifacts in the beginning, we may not be able to see the hidden, to get the hidden dialysis all along. If we didn't pay attention to the raw data, we thought the heart rate is always irregular. Of course, we missed the dialysis all along. Right. So knowing when to press which button is of paramount importance here. And implications of everyday practice, uh, ladies and gentlemen, movement related artifacts are extremely common in stress tests. Look at the raw data for interpretation. You should rely on that because raw data is, raw data means minimally filtered. Synthesize data that are heavily filtered for your benefit because I want it to look clean so that you can interpret the essay segment, which is of much interest to majority of our physicians friends here. But if the movement artifacts are too plentiful, then you have no choice to sort of scrap that segment of the stress test, uninterpretable. But before you scrap it, stop the exercise and record the recovery phase, which is immediate after what you think have, would have changes there. It may salvage the situation. So I would end this case by saying that what happened after exercise is what we emphasize all along is as important as what happened during exercise, which is the one that we emphasize all along. What happened after exercise is as important. During exercise is the one that we know is important, but what happened after exercise is equally important. All right, so with that, let's move on to the next case. Next case I call it is all in your mind. 48-year-old man, is a only risk factor is smoker, presented with typical angina upon exertion for the past six months. His uh, ADL is still fairly good, but he noticed that he could not exert himself to the fullest. As in like last time he used to do walking up the hill with his family, he couldn't do this anymore. He saw a local family doctor, the local family doctor said that you have IHD. You know, another word is coronary disease and started him on treatment, aspirin, statin, oil nitrates and referred him to a cardiologist Echo done was normal, and of course, the stress test was done at the same time. Standard boost protocol, stage three as nine minutes. He had the same chest pain. Now, I want to call my audience. This is a relatively simple one. Only two options here. When you look at this stress test, how would you interpret this stress test? Fairly clean, no more noise. <laughs> yeah. What do you think is a positive stress test or a negative stress test? Okay, we have a one-sided uh, result here. So, mm -hmm. well, almost about 90% says it's positive stress test. 90% right. says that. Great. Good. Let's move on. Now, I'm not implying that having a positive stress test should prompt you to go ahead straight away doing coronary angiogram, but this is what happened to the patient. This was one of my patients back in those days who are still in government service. He had a coronary angiogram done, which I think is not wrong. It's as part of the assessment. Now, this is the beginning of conundrum here. He had a coronary angiogram done. It was entirely normal. There's no epicardial coronary artery stenosis. And hence initiated this thought process here. There is really a disconnect here. How can you have a strongly positive stress test but at the same time, have an entirely normal angiogram. Now, what happened with this patient is, I ended up managing this patient at the end, but he told me that he saw his family doctors again for advice, since his family doctor is the one that said that he has ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease. But the family doctor now say that, since you have a normal angiogram, you need not to worry, uh, you have this condition called false positive stress test. And he said that, but I still have chest pain, doctor. He was told that it's on your mind. You stress too much, it's okay, you relax, you know, everything will just be fine. Now, he came and saw me, what happened, you know, there's a few visits uh, of a story here, but eventually what happened is, I ended up ordering another functional study for this patient. It's called nuclear perfusion scan. Essentially what it does is, it's looking for perfusion defect 
like lack of blood supply to a part of the myocardium. Now the finding is staggeringly uh, alarming here. It clearly shows a proportion defect at the anterolateral wall and the inferior wall with near 100% reversibility, which further confirmed that he did have exercise-induced ischemia. The progress is he was prescribed uh, this um, medication, uh, tramitazidine, uh, for a diagnosis of microvascular angina. Of course, the statin is further strengthened, the dose is further strengthened for reduction of LDL. And I think very importantly, because he has an angry looking wife standing behind him, he is able to quit smoking successfully. And other medication kept the same. I thought it was kind of a not so interesting story to tell, you know, it's a microvascular angina case, you know. But then I did something here. Uh, before I did something, actually four months later, he told me that he felt much better. He has more energy, more angina, uh, no more angina. Then he can resume his walking up the hill with his family again. For, uh, uh, for those of you all from this region, you can recognize this uh, area called Chiratukun, which is the place that I usually hike up, you know, in uh, Bukit Mataja. So I, I used to go there as well. And then I did something which I myself get surprised. When he said that he's better, I thought, no, I mean, I would believe that it's all in his mind, but then I wouldn't say that this is not nearly as surprising because Six months later, after intensive lifestyle med, uh, modification and also being on medication, he's able to perform stress test stage four, 11 minutes with no hint of pathological ST depression. Which bring her, brings us to this concept of what uh, we, I mean, especially my generation has been brought up when we got trained as cardiologists back in the year 2003, we always think that coronary artery disease or ischemic heart, ischemic heart disease is all but a focal stenosis at a fixed point in the epicardial coronary artery. Fast forward to the year 2013, the definition of uh, stable coronary artery disease has evolved from a focal plug related obstruction to a more diffuse one and variable etiology. That includes microvascular dysfunction. This cartoon clearly shows us that it makes sense for us to understand this this way because the epicardial coronary artery is just one part. In fact, it's constituted only less than 10% of the arterial system, the arterial system in the coronary artery. So if you look at this diagram, if you put the arterial system like a mesh in front of your eyes, you can't even see through it. It's such a dense system. That's how intricate it is. And again, fast forward to today, we have evolved again to a new term. In 2019, the European Society of Cardiology has come up with new guidelines on this term called the chronic coronary syndrome, whereby you can say is a step back, not a step forward, because a syndrome gives a connotation that we are not sure of the direct cause of a certain condition. Whereby if we call it a disease like before in 2013, we are sure of a causative agent. Now we are walking a step back. I think it's in the right direction because it's indeed a syndrome rather than a disease with variable etiology and also a wide ranging treatment options. Interventions is all but just one of them. Now, implication to everyday practice, I would put it this way, ladies and gentlemen, when we see positive stress tests, it should mean something. Think about it for a moment. Why should the machine lie to you? The machine cannot lie to you. As I've shown you in that case example, the patient did the stress test in the same machine. The patient was the same. The only difference is he was treated intensively with medication and lifestyle. But this something may not be easy, may not be readily visible on conventional angiogram. 
Now, this conventional angiogram, I call it the two-dimensional luminogram. Think about it. The corneal artery should be a three-dimensional structure. Now you are lighting it up, injecting contrast, and using X-ray to see the lumen, whether there's obstruction or not. There's already a limitation here. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that this test should not be done. It is a very important part of cardiac investigation and should be prescribed to any patient who needs it. But we need to be cognizant, be aware of the limitation that this test carries so that we won't be surprised when we see similar cases in our practice. Now, CCS is a new terminology. I think it's a great term because it replaces the old term as it encompasses a much wider scope of etiology and disease manifestation. And some of this can indeed be successfully treated with only lifestyle changes and medication, saving the need for expensive intervention. This is some good news for our patient. Okay, guys, let's move, move on to the third case. Third case, I call it more than meets the eyes. Unsuspecting 39-year-old man, no known medical illness presented for annual health screen, all blood tests are normal. He requested an, a stress test. Usually, as we say yes to any request. He did very well. Max heart rate achieved at 161 beats per minute, which is more than 85% of age predicted maximum heart rate, a target heart rate. Appropriate BP response. There is no abnormal ST or TV changes. There's no PVC during exercise, no chest pain. But you saw this. Recovery at six minutes. I wouldn't uh, bore you by uh, asking you how to interpret this. Let me just tell you that this is PVC. But instead, I'm going to ask you, what would you do? What would you advise the patient? There are a few options here. You only see a few PVCs. Otherwise, you can achieve a fairly good uh, exercise capacity. Let me see if you can pass. Or you want to refer to cardio or electrophysiologist. Or you want to review the patient back in three months, order a 24 hours holter, or you want to order an echocardiogram. Please pull. Okay, you can see the votes coming in. But honestly, for me, I will always want to send the patient to see an EP. I'm not sure about you, Ma. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a, a, good, a great option. Yeah. Mm. Let's not um, give uh, uh, biases to the audience first. Uh, let's just answer. Okay. <laughs> okay, so great. we have about 60% plus voted. So 51% ordered a 24 hour halter. 22 mm. ordered the. Echo, 19, like I said, <laughs> wants to send the patient to see an EP or cardio. 7% percent few PVCs, no big deal, pass the patient. And the rest come back three months later. Sure. So the week right. is 24 hour holder. Sure. Let's move on. Now, guys, whatever you do, this is one of the questions that you know my style already now. There's one of the questions that the rest will answer all correct, except one. Now, whatever you do, do not dismiss this PVC because this PVC happened during recovery phase. Now, with that, it's a mini general club time. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you high flying graphs or uh, stuff like that. So, I'm going to summarize these two um, papers for you. One is uh, actually the bottom here is actually published in JAMA, it's actually from Stanford University. Uh, published um, more than 10 years ago, in fact, and uh, more recently, a paper from collaboration between Hong Kong group and UK group here, Victor Lee and Pierre Lambiese. So, uh, published in Heart Asia. So, let's talk about the Stanford study first, because the Stanford study is actually a prospective trial, studying 1,847 healthy subjects. So, what they did was, they look at these healthy patients they subject them for excess stress tests, and then they analyze them according to no PVC at all, both during exercise or after exercise, versus at PVC occurring during exercise, or they have recovery phase exercise, means that during exercise, no PVC, but after exercise, 
got PVC recorded during recovery phase, or both. As you can see clearly from this graph that there is a significant drop in the cumulative survival over 10 years period of follow-up for those patients with either recovery phase PVC or both exercise plus recovery phase PVC. Now, this is a strong set of data and perspective. It's talking about mortality, survivability. Now, more recently in uh, this Lee et al. study, Hong Kong and United Kingdom, they meta-analyzed 10 studies here. They've been able to show that regardless whether you have clinical heart disease or without clinical heart disease, if you have PVC du during recovery phase, there's, already, there's always an increased relative risk of endpoints here, the combined endpoints. Combined endpoints here are non fatal myocardial infarction, angina, cardiac admissions, cardiac arrest, cardiovascular mortality, and all cause mortality. Now, you may wonder that how come there's so many endpoints here? Because this is a meta analysis of over 10 studies, they have highly variable endpoints here. But the message is now for the record, I wouldn't even want to tell you that there's a relative risk of 80% increase, which is here. You look at the risk ratio here, and to the 6%. I think it's unfair to judge this way because it sounds very, very high. But suffice to say, there is a signal towards increased risk of endpoints, including cardiovascular mortality, if we have recovery phase PVC after exercise test test. What are the implications to our everyday practice? Very simple. There's only three messages I have for my dear colleagues here. PVC doing exercise may be benign. I myself can say so. On the other hand, PVC post-exercise, i.e. during recovery phase, is not. The presence of PVC during recovery phase should prompt the treating physician to further investigate the patients. The key here is not to dismiss all PVC as entirely benign. And that is really the message I want you all to take home for today. Now, of course, you all will ask me how to manage PVC, which is a subject of a future seasons to come. Uh, may not be in the next season because I have topic for next season maybe, but future season. I call it a PVC, a tale from Asian pharaohs to modern times. Please stay tuned and then tune in to our next, next, next seasons. With that, I really thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, again, 